Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. We're back with you again this morning. This is a hundred and something episode of the COVID crisis. We wish it wasn't a hundred and something episode. We wish there were no episodes. That would be the best. But as COVID goes on, so do we. And I think we are beginning, all of us, to develop what I'm going to call cows. You can ask yourself, cows? People don't have cows. Actually, we do. It's COVID weariness syndrome. Yeah. I believe we all have cows. Yeah, absolutely. And Dana, mm -hmm. what are the numbers like today, and should we have cows? Um, we should just because we still have COVID patients in the hospital and you know still get very sick. But overall, the numbers are continuing to look a lot better, which is a very good thing. So 25 patients in the hospital today, 10 of those in the ICU, though, so almost half. Um, and then um, six of those on the, on the ventilator. So All right. And we still have sick. about the other patients who are here with us that are after their 10 days of mm -hmm. being infectious. So we yes. don't count them acutely. They are in our chronic count. And they what, are. Are those still 20 or 25? And that's there? 25, 26. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So, so still quite a few. Still and because we've patients. had discharges, but unfortunately, as Dr. Wild talked about yesterday, we're getting a lot of we're admissions. We're continuing to get admissions. Yeah, we are. Um, even people who don't know they're ill, since we are screening all of our perioperative, preoperative patients and all of our admissions to the hospital, we are finding some of those as well that are positive. All right. So my family didn't think I would really say cows on the air, mm -hmm. neither did the CF team. I warned them it was coming today. What do you think of COVID weariness? I like it. I think, um, Pretty good? I think it should be patented. I think it should yeah. be patented. I think we should put a little cow right here on the desk. It's a true this. entity. I mean, everybody I, it, has it. We all have for COVID for weariness. For various reasons. Yeah. And, yeah. and there are different degrees at different any time. Degrees. And, all right. Absolutely. Chris Wilson is here. But Chris is the VP of System Integration and Innovation. That's a lot of eyes, but he also has cows. He's here at the University, of, in his job here at the University of Kansas Health System. Chris has done a great job helping us work with the University of Kansas at Lawrence, trying to put together our entire testing program there, working so hard to make sure we had testing available, helping coordinate what the campus return to school policy is going to be. So we're going to talk about about how uh, your work has been, and the, especially the work you're doing with Clinical Reference Laboratory. And their CEO, Robert Thompson, is with us today. We're just going to say CRL for short because it's quicker. It's kind of like saying cows instead of COVID weariness syndrome. We're going to say CRL instead of Clinical Reference Laboratory. They've been a great partner to the health system in trying to work through the testing that we're doing in Lawrence and elsewhere, and especially about saliva testing. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, talk to us a little bit about your work and what's going on there. Uh, well, we've been partnering with the University of Kansas and Lawrence for a variety of infection prevention and pandemic preparedness and readiness around return to campus. And, and probably the most significant effort that we've undertaken is testing. Um, so we're doing a variety of different types of testing work with the campus. Um, and the, the biggest and sort of most timely topic is the mass testing and the entry screening testing that we're doing from a surveillance perspective. So this is for the asymptomatic individuals. These aren't the people that are already sick. These are the individuals that are coming back to campus, coming back to the Lawrence community. Um, so students, faculty, and staff that are returning to campus uh, uh, starting uh, later this month uh, with the idea that all of those individuals will uh, receive a COVID test uh, prior to returning to campus on September 7th, uh, with some minor exceptions for those that maybe have tested positive in the past over the summer. Uh, but the, uh, the, the goal is for us to be able to determine what the positivity looks like for that population as they re-enter campus, um, be able to identify pockets of potential positive individuals, um, intervene, uh, and, and prevent the further spread, um, and also establish a baseline uh, for what the school year could look like, and then do regular surveillance testing for those individuals throughout the course of the year. With the overall goal being if we can identify positives from the beginning, remove them from the campus community as best we can, either keeping them at home, keeping them in isolation, uh, removing them from the day-to-day -day activities of the campus uh, so we can have as safe as a reopening of campus as possible. So yesterday, one of the big college headlines was at the University of North Carolina, where things have not gone especially well. What happened in North Carolina, and what are we doing to prevent it from happening here at, at uh, University of Kansas? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, the University of North Carolina went to all online classes yesterday after just about a week uh, of being on campus. Uh, they had three outbreaks in on-campus housing, one in a fraternity, uh, and uh, positivity rates that were, um, I think, pretty alarming to the folks there. And so pretty rapidly, they had to make a change. Uh, and go uh, from uh, a, a hybrid model of being on and off campus to one that's uh, online only. 
Um, and so what, what we're doing, I think, is an approach that can help mitigate those situations. So, Because the Jayhawks are going to be the Tar Heels. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, that's the most important thing we could probably I, I talk think about so. today. So. No question. Uh, but, uh, you know, for, for on-campus housing, for instance, what the approach the, the housing director, Sarah Waters, did was great, I thought. So um, they do a stage move. And so vast majority of the folks that are coming back to campus are coming, moving their, um, you know, their stuff in, their, their books and their clothes and their materials in. Uh, and then, then taking a test, and then leaving. Like a, a written test? Uh, no. Uh, so uh, uh -huh. it so is college. It, it, what we're doing is saliva testing. Okay. Um, and so they're they're taking a self-administered saliva test that we partnered with CRL to perform. So when we get those positives, they're not on campus. So they're 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 back home. Uh, that allows us to maintain isolation capacity on campus, and also allows us to um, to to help. Uh, um, monitor and reduce the potential for positive students interacting with others really before they have symptoms. So again, that asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic population. That's a big deal. We thought it was mass migration coming to Lawrence. I think that kind of made us all shiver in our boots just a bit. Mm -hmm. And we had to come up with some strategy. Hopefully this is going to work. What do you think is the most important variable going to be though? What, what will really determine our success or failure? I think, uh, I, I think testing is probably the biggest uh, thing that we can um, do right now. But very quickly, I think we're going to shift from continuing surveillance testing over to individual behavior and just how well I think the students on campus can, um, can get on board, basically, with um, masking, with distancing, um, with demonstrating, uh, modeling good behavior uh, that we need to have during a pandemic. Um, so that we don't end up like a situation that North Carolina has. And I was listening to a, a, a radio story this morning about campuses across the country, and they're interviewing students. And the students want to be back on campus. They, they really miss their campus life. Um, and I remember at that time in my life, yeah, well, they don't, I, it's, see, it's, it's, they it's a don't fun miss time. mom and dad. They miss right. the campus. That sounds familiar to me. Right. Um, but it's going to be different. So yeah. they're, 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 they're going to have to adapt. Um, students have to adapt. Faculty, staff have to adapt. Uh, and so I think for the next couple of weeks, we're going to see a lot of that um, that change management, frankly, of how, of how they're going to have to re-enter the campus world. All right, so Jayhawks beat Tar Heels. Do not get cows so bad you forget that you still have to follow the critical rules of infection control because that's what's going to mm -hmm. beat, beat down the Tar Heels. So let's go Jayhawks. Um, Robert Thompson, CEO of Clinical Reference Lab. A, I hope you're not a Tar Heel. And B, talk to us a little bit about the things you're doing at CRL to help keep our community safe and the campus safe. Let's talk saliva testing. All right, when the crisis hit, we looked around and said, what can we do to help here? And we have a lot of experience with saliva as a testing matrix. So we decided fairly early on that we would focus on a self-collected saliva test which in our study showed itself to be 100% as accurate as those big, long nasal swabs that you kind of go up and tickle your brain. Um, and so, you know, we worked our way through the FDA process. Things went really well. The FDA gave us our approval about two and a half weeks ago. Um, and now our goal is to help Kansas get back to work and get, uh, get back to school. So how does the saliva thing work? Because we probably ought to talk a little bit about what it means to do pool testing, which I think has been really important on the Lawrence campus and really for large businesses and other large scale testing. Right, so saliva is a, there's a lot of virus in saliva. It's sort of very similar uh, in terms of a sample type to what you would get from those long nasal swabs. So uh, what we're doing with it is the same kind of test. It's a PCR test that tests for live virus. Um, but we're also using this technique that you mentioned called pooling, where we take five individual samples that we've collected from students or, or employees, and we test them together in the laboratory. And that allows us, actually reduces the cost and allows us to test a lot more samples much more quickly so that we can achieve the turnaround time that we're getting, which is currently, you know, 24 to 48 hours. We're averaging 13 hours right now. So I just remember growing up, my parents always said, don't spit, don't spit, that's gross. And now we're saying, spit, spit, spit. It's kind of a different message for our, our culture and our society a little bit. It is. This is one of the first tests that we've uh, actually had where spit is a, an accepted matrix. It's one of the unique things about coronavirus, uh, that there's a decent amount of it in spit. Um, we're also looking at a, a, new, a new test that combines coronavirus and the flu and two types of flu actually, and we'll be testing to see whether or not that testing is feasible in saliva as well. 
Uh, that would be pretty awesome because that would mean no swabs, and right. I'll be a, I'll be a fan of that one. Which is which is really kind of one of the um, major benefits of the saliva testing method is uh, with with a nasal pharyngeal swab, you need a trained clinician who is there in PPE that's performing the nasal swab test. Yes. With a self-administered saliva test, we're able to test much more people, a, a lot a lot larger groups in a quicker amount of time without a labor force, a labor force that, by the way, is also trying to take care of patients that are sick in hospitals and mm -hmm. clinics right now, yep. um, without the PPE burn that we would have had otherwise. So it's, it's, a, it's a really advantageous approach for doing this mass surveillance testing that we're doing on the campus in Lawrence. I like that. I think, it, I think that sounds great. So good luck on that and good luck. So now, you didn't really tell me what college you went to. I gotta be careful I don't insult them as well, Robert. What, what's your school? I went to the University of Pennsylvania undergrad and Harvard graduate. Okay, so I don't think I'll insult those right now. My wife went to Princeton. I was nowhere near that smart. And um, I suspect, though, that uh, the Jayhawks would beat them anyway. Oh, Jill. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> in many things, maybe not in everything. Media questions. Not getting any, Jill? I bet there's questions from our listening audience today. Yeah, and we actually do have one from a reporter who texted me last night with uh, 41 Action News. And there is an Olathe teacher who was written up in the Washington Post for creating a Google Doc that tracks um, outbreaks in schools. And the reporter wants to know what the doctors and, and, and Chris and Robert, what people think about that. Is that too scary? Should right. we be tracking? And you might want to talk about the accuracy. Yeah, Hawkeye. So, you know, when I went and tried, I read about that last mm -hmm. night, uh, Jill Props this, of course, and yeah. she'd sent that out, and yeah. I was taking a look at it. I don't think it's scary at all. I think it's actually yeah. it's an interesting idea because people are essentially treating this as like a Wikipedia for school cases. Yeah. And it's self reported, self administered. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the only thing is, like, when we report our data to HHS, there are some specific criteria we have to use it to be very accurate. We're held accountable for it. Different bad things happen if we don't tell the truth. And so, so the only thing I know, the only thing I would say is that the, 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 what the teacher is doing is probably a terrific public service. Yeah. It may not have the same degree of accuracy as what we, we report to, uh, report to. But I think it's an interesting way of being able to look at how schools are doing from the vision and the lens of the people that are working at the school. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, you know, it isn't um, protective health information. It's all done by the public, and especially like you said, the people who are working in the schools. I think it's probably a good um, maybe bellwether of everything that is going on or in where, wherever somebody is reporting from. We certainly, it should not be a scary thing. It is just that we have talked about, we aren't doing any of this to, um, to induce fear, but more knowledge to uh, let you be more knowledgeable about everything that's going on. I think this is one more piece of that. And I think if it is done by the public and the teachers, um, can you validate the accuracy? That's the big question. But it really shouldn't uh, be for fear, but more for knowledge to, to give you one more piece to deal with and, and um, make your decisions from. If we're going to be relying on folks for individual responsibility, we want to give them as much information as they can to be informed about their actions. Yeah. And I think that's a great example of how we can get in, in people more information to help inform what they're going to do in their day to days and trying to get back to whatever our new normal is. Yeah, I think it's awesome. And I think having somebody take initiative to do that is a great thing. And because schools are clearly such a major risk for all of us, it interrupts our bubbles, it changes our world. And our kids go out there and they come back and they're in contact with other kids. And hopefully we're not going to be like North Carolina, watch it go bad in a week or two. Hopefully it'll last longer and hopefully we can get through a semester. So I think it's all about the good planning that people do. And then like we, we did are doing at KU, I, I, I strongly believe that this entry testing is a, is a key because you can get people isolated right away who are mm -hmm. positive and then you don't have the initial carriers going into the campus. And that's what scares me right yeah. there. So. Yeah. Well, we're, we're testing, you know, 20, 25,000 individuals in a community of 80,000 people as they re-enter this, that's a lot. this world. So it's, it's a large chunk of the population. And, and that's the students, but you're also testing the staff, right? Yeah, faculty and staff as well. That's a big yeah. number, mm -hmm. approximately a very big number. Yeah. Okay, Jill. <laughs> Another reported question, this one just in from Channel 9, how soon could we see the saliva testing and where? Doctor's offices, pharmacy? All right. Great. Robert, where are we going to see this testing? I mean, we're seeing it in Lawrence. You, if you're a student right now, you're doing it. So where else are you going? Um, there's a lot of activity right now. We're uh, in, even in just in the Kansas area, we're talking to several K through 12 schools several of which have already kicked off uh, testing this week. 
they're taking it very seriously. Um, and, and most of our clients that I'm seeing, they are doing that, that entry testing. Um, and if they don't, you're effectively allowing, you know, in the in case of a, a university, 100 to 200 COVID positive people to migrate to your town, that's a, a significant problem. So I think they're doing, um, they're all doing the right thing. We are looking at doctor's offices. There's several employers that are doing this as well. Um, and we have, uh, gosh, it's been a lot of interest. We uh, signed a contract just um, this morning actually with uh, LA United School District. So we're the largest school district in California. Um, and they're gonna be doing testing as well. We can't do all of their testing, but we're gonna be doing a chunk of it for them. So you'll be seeing a lot of us in schools, uh, K through 12 universities, employers, and just now beginning to trickle into, especially some of the urgent care clinics. How many can you do a day? 20,000, uh, and we're ramping up to, we think we can get to 50,000 by the end of September. Talk a little bit about the Yale spit test protocol that came out. People talked a lot about that on the weekend, got a little left EA action. So how is your things, well, first of all, tell us about the Yale deal, and then tell us how it's different from what you, you all are doing. So what Yale did, did, Go ahead. What Yale did was it actually kind of, uh, it just eliminated one of the steps in the PCR process. So you go through, uh, when you bring a specimen in, you go through an extraction step where it's, a, it's the RNA extraction. So you're extracting the RNA from the sample. And then you go through uh, PCR, uh, normal PCR testing. They've eliminated that test, that first step, which is the RNA extraction. And to some degree, that's valuable because there's been a shortage of RNA extraction kits on the marketplace. And so a lot of places could do more testing if they were not doing uh, that RNA uh, step. It's not really a big piece of the, of the cost chain. I think that's been a little misrepresented on, on the, in the news saying it's a $10 test. Yeah, it's $10 of materials, but materials are not the majority of the expense. The equipment, the personnel is really where all the expense lies. So I'm happy because I think it's going to expand the capacity of the nation to do more testing. Um, the trade-off scientifically, if you, don't ample, if you don't do the RNA extraction, you lose sensitivity. And uh, its numbers are roughly 5% false negatives and 5% false positives. Yeah, that's kind of, I don't like that number, especially depending on what the background community prevalence is. So, yeah. that, so you guys aren't gonna eliminate that step, you're gonna keep doing it. That's correct. How far are we away from having somebody be able to run it at their home by themselves? Well, our tests can be home collected, but you cannot run the test at home. So our FDA approval included the idea that we could ship a kit off to somebody. Uh, we're doing this with Emporia State as an example before the students arrive, and they run the test on themselves at home, FedEx it back, and we can do it. In terms of an actual full test being done at home, there are two or three companies that are working on antigen tests that do that. Now, antigen tests are also not as accurate. They will not pick you up in the early stages of the, of the infection. And so, you know, it'll have its uses, I think, especially if it's done quite frequently. Um, I think we're probably a month away. Okay. Dana, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. Um, anything we can do to get more access to tests for everybody that is gonna be one step closer to us getting the spread of this disease down and decreased. And if we can get it to all of the health systems and the um, individual clinics and even you know the other private entities like CVS that already offer vaccines and things of that nature, um, if we can get more access to testing for everybody, that is gonna be one more step prior to vaccines and really other optimal treatments that we can do to stop yeah, this especially disease. Especially the good yeah. turnaround time. So. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's just incredible if uh, you think about where we were four or five months ago from yeah. a testing standpoint mm -hmm. where we were kind of using, let's say, the more traditional model of nasal pharyngeal swabs and, and going to your clinic to get a test to yeah. then the drive-through approach. Now we're talking about saliva, then mm -hmm. we're talking about home collection, now we're talking about home actually tests and analysis. Yeah. In a very short amount of time, it, CRL's FDA approval was two and a half weeks ago. And we have, we've started mass collection testing um, for the students in Lawrence within the last week. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, very quick turnaround time and the, and the growth in the industry and the, rail, the Yale study, it, it's, it, it's pretty impressive. 
Dr. Burke's quoted that uh, when she was here with us on Saturday, Dr. Tom or Robert Thompson was there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dane and I were both there, but she said that the United States is doing 70 percent of the world's COVID testing. That seems like a high percentage. On the other hand, we have 25 percent of the cases and 5 percent of the world's population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that are a little off balance here. Yeah. Jill, next question. There, people are wanting some clarification between um, if if the saliva test that CRL is using is the DART test from Harvard? Is it their test? Is it the same? Okay, you want to clarify this, yeah. up, uh, Robert, for us? No, it's our own test. It is not uh, from anywhere else. We are using uh, the probes and primers, which is the critical function here, are from a company called Co-Diagnostics in, in Utah. Um, but we took that, put it together with a collection device from Canada and, um, and our own methodologies to uh, come up with our own EUA. And so when you say that, Harvard could be having their own technique and their own, but the reality is that the testing that you guys have done has been validated, our labs validated it. We worked together very closely, I think, to help make sure we felt good about it, helped we work on the, the EUA together. So I think we're all really comfortable with the work that you guys are doing. We feel like it's, like you say, it may well be as good as a nasal swab, and that's a statement most people can't make. Mm -hmm. Well, our data certainly backs that up. Jill. Okay. Um, Kim wants to know if you would clarify. She says a lot of college students are getting tested, then going back to their place and living on campus or off-campus housing before they get the results. What do you mean that they are going home? All right, Chris, let's clarify that a little bit. Yeah, sure. For, protocol. for the on-campus housing population, there's a large uh, portion, I think it's about 75% of the on-campus housing population that lives within the region. Uh, so those individuals are doing a stage move in. So they will come move their move their things into their place, into, into their dorm room, take a test, and then they leave. They go back to their home. Uh, and then by that point in time, they get their results. And if they get a positive, they will stay home. They won't come back to campus and uh, as a positive. Yeah, they have to wait for two weeks or 10 days. How long do you make them wait? Yeah, so uh, the same process that they would use and that we would use yeah. in advising a patient. So if they're, if they're positive um, and they're asymptomatic, you're going to have 10 days of isolation and 72 hours of being symptom free. Um, if, they're continue to, if they develop symptoms or continue to have symptoms, it'll be until those symptoms resolve. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it'd be the same uh, time frames that we would use with patients as it was so we have for the last if, several months. I'm sorry. What happens if a, uh, one of the students lives further away, say 500 miles away? Do they have to go back home, or what's the, what's the accommodation then? So the, the, the campus in Lawrence has uh, invested in um, some isolation housing, um, some specific facilities to be able to house students. Nate Smith Dorma. Yeah, so I think right it's around 200 units uh, total that they have that are available for isolation housing. And to add that um, we work closely with Lawrence Memorial Hospital as well as Watkins Health Center to try to make sure people are ready for more patients. And actually, we've done modeling with the county so that we can know that LMH is ready for any potential influx of students. Mm -hmm. and, and if they're not, we will be. Yeah, LMH has been a great partner. So in fact, LMH has helped us uh, manage the, uh, the testing for the faculty and staff uh, with the saliva surveillance testing. So Jared Abel's done a great job with that work. Um, and we've partnered with uh, you know analytics teams and population health teams in the county, a lot of physicians, yourself and Dr. Hawkinson, uh, to uh, project what we think um, the impact of uh, the students moving back to campus will be. Um, uh, results so far look like LMH would be able to handle any of the of the uh, cases that arise and the hospitalizations that arise from that uh, the students and the and the campus reopening. Uh, so it's uh, there's there's a lot of good work that's going into that. It will continue daily. We'll update that information regularly. We're get, we get more information every day, whether it's results from testing or or pockets of individuals that have tested positive, um, or not tested positive. You know, the, it, we're we're seeing some pretty good results so far. Yeah, that's that's great news. And and so we really we're we're trying to make sure these students stay safe, keep the community safe by doing that. And all we right. do have all those partners meeting daily. I mean, you um, mm -hmm. organize it every day, so we are meeting quite actively and frequently about all this. Yeah, yeah we have a meeting at 7.30 every morning that uh, Dr. Hawkinson gets to attend prior to coming on this show uh, with several physicians and leaders uh, in the Lawrence campus, uh, Lawrence Memorial, uh, and the University of Kansas Health System that are reviewing data, that are talking about um, issues that may have come up in the last 24 hours. Uh, and, and then every week we get our pandemic medical advisory team together that Dr. Stites chairs that, uh, to really look at what, what are some of the critical factors and key decisions that we need to make to help keep the campus and the community safe. And you wonder why we may have cows. <laughs> That's COVID weariness syndrome for those of you who didn't tune in at the beginning of the program. Jill, next question. 
All right, so Craig has a multi-part question. He wants to know how long from a positive test result is someone likely to shed the virus? And then as he follows up, he gets down here and he wants to know, is there a T cell response test? Oh, here you go, Great. Dana. Somebody <laughs> wants to dig yeah. into a little science, buddy. Let's do that. That's good. Well, I do have to present a journal club to all the infectious disease faculty and staff today, so and the fellows. Is that being zoomed live so people um, can hear what you're it's doing? It's on Blackboard, so I think it's just internal. Okay. So anybody else on campus can look at it. But basically, one of uh, the journal that I'm presenting is answers one of those questions. So there are two or three or four um, good uh, peer-reviewed articles that talk about how long are you infectious. The best evidence we have right now is about eight to nine days from your symptom onset. And this is based on symptoms. It is based on upper respiratory tract, PCR viral load, as well as the ability to obtain um, replication competent virus or culturable virus. And so what they found is that really after about eight, um, nine days, they were unable to um, identify uh, replication competent virus from the upper respiratory tract. So that is what we're thinking, and that is what um, the CDC guidelines are based on, those references. Um, that is what the KDHE guidelines are based on, those references. Certainly we are always ready and willing to accept more um, information and data, but again, those are the best peer-reviewed articles. Um, one of them, I think, is from Nature. One is from New England Journal of Medicine. So it's a wide variety of really respected journals. And um, to answer your question, it's about eight to nine days. And that's why we use the 10 days after symptom onset. All right. So I think the T-cell response, oh, what are you thinking about response. that? Yeah, so T-cell response, we know, is extremely important in this and many other viral diseases. Um, there have been studies out there showing maybe there's some cross-reactivity from other common coronaviruses that cause the common cold, and that just means that those T-cells may re respond to this new SARS-CoV-2 as well. I think that's pretty minimal, knowing that we have 80 to 90 percent of adults have had contact with those coronaviruses, and you obviously saw what happened in New York and the devastation there and every, every, every other place as well. But there is some T-cell responses. Moving forward for vaccination and immunization, T cell responses are gonna be important as well. And other data to suggest and show that that is important is even people who have recovered from coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, have shown that they really, some of them, and it's a small subpopulation, don't really have detectable antibodies, but we know they've recovered from the virus, the infection, so it is probably that T cell response. So moving forward, whether it's um, treatment or getting over the disease by yourself and not having to go to the hospital, or vaccination, we know that um, an antibody response, but also a T cell response is gonna be extremely important. Right. Well, one of the other Please. things that's come up in our, our Lawrence testing is individuals that have tested positive within the last 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and we, we don't retest those individuals because over time they can continue to shed the virus and, and detect as positive even though they aren't infectious any, yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, we do that to, you know, conserve resources yeah. and, and be able to provide as many tests to as many people as we can yeah. um, and, and not repeat tests that are yeah, already we're showing. Hoping that they're not get through, yeah. To answer the question too, there is no um, readily available, easy commercial test for T-cell response. So. Okay. It might be a good time to clarify when, because people are asking, when are you contagious when you're shedding the virus? All right. And you mm -hmm. just said you can shed the virus and not be contagious. So yeah. can you walk through that? Danny, you want to try and take us back through that again? Yeah, so this is, um, again, based on a few studies. We believe that you are most contagious probably one to two days prior to symptoms to really one to two days after symptoms uh, start. Now, that um, infectious period does decrease as the start of symptoms decreases. But we have also seen that people, especially in the nursing home where this study was done, you can detect the days uh, you can detect the virus at least six days prior to having any symptoms at all. Uh, but we believe that you are most infectious one to two days prior to any symptoms to one to two days after. And that is why masking for everybody is so important. And we said, we won't mask unless we're sick. Well, unfortunately with this, because of that, if you are in the pre-symptomatic stage, or if you are one of the 30 to 40% who are asymptomatic, you can still spread the virus because even asymptomatic people can spread the virus. That's why the masking and the barrier protection is so important. 
Okay. Chris mentioned regular surveillance. How frequently will that, what is that? What's the frequency? Uh, it's going to depend. So it'll depend on what we see from these initial results. So if it's um, maybe in communities like the Greek community, uh, the on-campus housing, if we see positives there, we would do more frequent surveillance testing there. Um, we've also probably do some randomized um, uh, as well. So uh, just selected whether it's weekly, monthly, it's going to depend on the group. Um, so the intervals will, will vary depending on the circumstances. Um, at least as of right now, there's not uh, a thought to do everybody every week, everybody every month uh, at, this, at this point in time. And Robert, from your standpoint, this frequent testing, is that going to put a strain on C CRL? No, we've maintained, sort of deliberately maintained excess capacity so that we can handle surges when our clients need it um, because they've all asked us to do that. Uh, so we're not really concerned about that. Turnaround time. Uh, our turnaround time is 24 to 48 hours. Okay. And so yeah. that's been good. It's been great. Uh, uh, for, for, you know, 95% plus, I've seen 24 or even less. Um, I checked some results yesterday from Robert's lab that, uh, were, that came in um, with, with basically within half a day. Yeah. Uh, we're, we have, I think right now, Robert, we're up to four courier runs a day from Lawrence to Robert's lab. Uh, and so we're, we're currying samples back and forth very regularly in there, um, and many are getting results day of. Robert. You mentioned antigen testing. Let's spend just a moment on antigen testing. How is that different in your mind? Just talk to us a little bit about the difference between antigen and PCR testing. So PCR testing tests for the, the viral nucleic acids you know, directly, whereas antigen testing tests for, for the proteins on the exterior of the virus. Um, the difference in practical terms is that antigen testing is not amplified. So with with uh, DNA-based testing, when you do the testing, you're sort of, think of it as sort of concentrating the sample. Um, you really can't do that in antigen-based testing. There's no amplification step. So it tends to uh, be accurate, but it will not pick up, you know, the, the doctor was, was talking about how quickly you can detect you know, virus in somebody how many days prior to symptoms, and those are very infectious days. Uh, I think it's an open question whether or not antigen testing will detect it early enough to catch people pre-symptoms, um, and that's sort of one of the open science questions we're all waiting to hear the answer to. So as I understand yeah. it, Dana, if you're positive, you're positive with antigen testing, mm -hmm. but if you're negative, you may still be positive or that's, not. Yeah, that's true. And, and just as Robert was talking about, a lot of that has to do with the viral load or the viral concentration. We don't know exactly what that break point is as far as being infectious. Right now, a lot of um, the data being thrown around in the ability to culture virus is if you have basically a million copies um, per mil, you are more infectious, say, than 100,000 copies. So we, we go by log. Um, and basically, 10 to the 6 copies per mil, you can culture virus, you are more detectable, you're probably more infectious. If you're 10 to the 5th log, you are not as infectious. Will you still be able to pick that up? I think in those concentrations, you can still pick up the virus. Um, but certainly, we know that the sensitivity has decreased from PCR just a little bit. All right, Jill, time for probably one or two more questions. Yeah, I've got lots of them. Um, people are asking, where will the positive tests at KU count? In Kansas or in their home state? Uh, they, they will count in their home, well, they'll count in the county where they took the test, so the home county in this case. We've asked individuals to use their Douglas County address so that when we do public health reporting, when Robert's lab has to do his required public health reporting, uh, that it'll come back to Douglas County so they can track. And that's really important from the county perspective yeah. because mm -hmm. it's really where the, 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 the student is at the time they're positive because that's where the disease right. is going to get spread. So it really is important to maintain that, that element of the testing. Yeah. Um, a couple of more is, um, is the test only good for the day you take it? unless you isolate after the test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. So Dana, let's talk, that, talk about that. Yeah. One of the problem with all COVID testing is it's good for the day you take it, and after that, it totally depends on what happens to you and yeah. what your behaviors are. Absolutely, and you know, for people who are getting procedures and surgeries, we've allowed that 48 hours. Occasionally, in extenuating circumstances, 72 hours. But we tell you to go home and isolate. Yep. You're supposed to have self-isolation yeah. and self-quarantine so that you don't go back and pick up the virus because we don't want you to have a bad, bad outcome of surgery. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so absolutely that test is probably good for just that day, that point in time. As you get further out, one day, two days, three days, 
it is going to be less accurate because you could start shedding virus at that point. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we really focus on the positives for the entry testing. Um, we don't want the negatives to be perceived as a get out of COVID free. Okay. Yeah, we don't want it. No, go get out of COVID <laughs> free because there's too many cows out there. All right. Okay, final, final. Is it covered by insurance? Uh, the testing that's going on in Lawrence is provided for at no cost by the university. And the university has funding from the government as part of the, the um, which is a spark, the spark fund, fund, which is a part of the CARES Act. I'm, I'm going to get my, my CARES and my sparks and all that mixed up, but <laughs> it is funded by some of the government initiative to help reopen schools right. and reopen universities. So. Well, as we wind down today, let me first turn to Robert Thompson, the CEO at CRL. Um, thank you so much for the great work you and your team are doing. It is really making a difference. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts for, from, from your uh, standpoint today. I just want to thank the Kansas team. I mean, what we're doing in some ways is the easy part of this. The hard part is organizing, getting samples from 25,000 students. And the team at Kansas has been doing an amazing job. Thank you. Chris Wilson, uh, you've been I, kind of the guy who's putting all this stuff together to help mm -hmm. KU. I know they're, they're very appreciative. Well, I, I'd want to leave with the thought that there's a lot of people, especially on campus in Lawrence, uh, who have done something. Andrew that Foster. Never, Andrew Foster, that specifically. We want to yep. give Andrew a big thanks and shout out. Um, um, that's basically done something that no one's done before, uh, mass reentry testing for a college campus, and organized that. And um, there's no waits. It's going relatively smoothly. Uh, we're getting uh, pretty low uh, error rates uh, on the collection. So. Um, a, a big thank you to all the folks at the KU team that have uh, made this go job. well. Yeah. And, a, and a hats off to Doug Gerard, the, the chancellor, for helping us work and saying, gosh, this is absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah. And yeah. I think not every school is doing it. That's why the Jayhawks are going to beat the Tar Heels. That's right. Having that vision, that was good of Chancellor Gerard. Um, well, as we move forward, you know, we continue to hope that once they get on campus, the students and that population continues to do the right thing, just as we all need to continue to do the right thing, and that is mask wearing physical distancing, not meeting in large groups. Um, certainly for some populations, that's a little bit easier than others, but that is the way that until we have accurate daily testing and until we have vaccination and optimal therapy, that's the way that we're gonna um, stop the spread of this disease and get you know, back to some normal life. And, that's, and keep our campuses open. Mm -hmm. So yeah, COVID weariness syndrome, <laughs> it is real. You don't wanna have it. How do you stop it? Well, I think you already know the answer to that question because we say it every mm -hmm. day, okay. wear a mask keep your distance, wash your hands, don't go out if you're sick, cough into your elbow, and please, please, please stay safe. You don't want cows. The best place to avoid it is to make sure that you stay home. Hey, tomorrow we're gonna to talk more about going back to school because that is, I think, the hot topic. And, and, and Steve Lauer is one of our outstanding pediatricians is here to visit with us, along with David Smith. David's been on our program before. He is the Youth Sports Medical Director for the, um, I can't remember what all the case stands for, but mm -hmm. the group that organizes high school sports and uh, school sports, scholastic sports. Also, please send us your photos through Facebook Messenger at KU Hospital. We need more of those photos. You can also email them to medicalnewsnetwork at kmc.edu. We do are gonna finish with some pictures today from CRL Lab, because there's some pretty good photos of people doing the job to help keep us all safe by doing the tests and running those tests. Thank you all for listening today. Keep your cows at home, stay home, stay safe, shelter at home. We'll be back with you tomorrow.